I hope this will be a truly offensive occasion, uh, <laughs> since that's what we're going to discuss. But there's a paradox before we really get going, which is that, of course, the subject in part that we're discussing is no platforming. And there are no platformers on the platform for obvious reasons, <laughs> which is rather ironic when you think about it. But I will try and represent the arguments in the course of this for no platforming uh, altogether. Last year, Ireland voted to get rid of its blasphemy laws and most applauded the new right to offend the Catholic Church. We also expect our press and our comedians to be viciously critical or even offensive to our leaders. Yet to avoid giving offence, student campuses are introducing no platforming and safe spaces. Should we seek to eradicate offence, uh, to create a more tolerant and equal society, or is offence vital to freedom and a critical means of containing the powerful? We've got a cracking panel for you. On my right is Joanna Williams. Uh, she's the author of Women vs. Feminism, an associate editor of the political magazine Spiked, and the head of education and culture at Policy Exchange. Uh, Yasmin Alibi Brown is on my immediate left, uh, a very respected pundit who writes regularly for the I, International Business Times, and New European. And David Aronovich on the far left, well, he was once, but no longer. <laughs> He's an award winning journalist and broadcaster. He once worked for the BBC. He writes a regular column for the Times, and he sits on the board of the Index on Censorship. And Joanna. So I think the right to be offensive is absolutely vital in a society that purports to uh, uphold a belief in free speech. Uh, for one thing, we don't need the right to free speech for what's inoffensive. We can be as bland and as boring as we like, and nobody's ever going to challenge us. We only need the right to be uh, the right to free speech, and it becomes meaningful and important when we're going to say things that might upset other people. Uh, my second argument is that uh, free speech, and most importantly, the right to be offensive, is necessary for society to advance. If you think about all the major leaps forward we've made as a society, whether we're talking about abolishing slavery, universal suffrage, uh, gay marriage, um, anything you can think of, evolution, all of these ideas have grossly offended some sections of society. And if we didn't have the right to offend, we wouldn't have been able to argue for those uh, causes, which I think we would all agree now are hugely progressive and really important. We needed to be able to offend to make the case for those things. Uh, the final point I'd make, uh, and this is where I, I'm so sorry, Yasmin, but I just don't know why you would be here today if you think words can't change people's It's called views. debate. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Debate's so important to try and change people's minds, to change people's views. Not ideologues. Because words are important, words are very important indeed, because however much we might wish it were otherwise, we can't just magic bad ideas away. And there are an awful lot of bad ideas out there in the world, and we need debate, we need the right to be offensive, we need free speech to be able to challenge those bad ideas. Yasmin, your outline. I think uh, bad ideas or good ideas, yes, require words and bravery. But I don't think there is a duty on free speeches to offend. And that's the problem. People think they're being awfully brave when they pick on certain groups and not on others and deliberately set out to offend them. I have four letters from four wannabe novelists who sought from me a comment to suggest that they should have the fatwa because their sales would go up. I don't think there's a duty to offend. There is a right. Are you going to name them? Uh, then unknown novelists who wanted a fatwa. I can give you the list afterwards. So I think there is civilized discourse. I think absolutely I agree with you that difficult ideas need to be argued for. But ideologues and people who are set in their ways, it's a waste of my time and theirs. But also, let me just quote somebody I really admire, Deborah Orr, who says, who really thinks the right to offend is inalienable? Who believes that some hideous error was made when it became untenable to put up notices in your pub saying no blacks, no Irish, no dogs? Who thinks those were better times? And that's where I'm coming from. There's a limit. There are people who set out to offend certain groups of people. And there are people who are brave and who are arguing in very difficult circumstances. There are issues that are very difficult to argue without being threatened and being 
um, up, and, and, and that does cause upset. But my problem is that free, free speech warriors now think it's their duty to demean and insult and dehumanize groups of people, often those who are powerless. And I can't go with that. David. Um, I think I'm going to begin by quarreling, which is a really bad thing to do with the title of the session, but only in this sense. I don't really think that offence is the big question here. Uh, it is for some people, um, and quite often, and in fact we've just heard an example of it, when people use the term offence, they actually mean something different, which is they mean, are there things that people can do, can say, which are dangerous? for other people, and if there, we believe there are, what are, 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 is our ability, if we have it, to stop them a worse danger in the round than the thing that they are saying? And I think that's really what the debate about free speech is about. So let me uh, give uh, an obvious example which we could come down to, the problem of hate speech. And by the way, what we can see on, uh, on this freedom of speech question is a kind of pendulum which was swinging very much in favour of uh, free speech in almost every regard, but I'm talking about the democratic West, largely until the advent of social media about a decade ago. Uh, and after that, we've been in a perpetual war about what should be permitted and what shouldn't be permitted because of the ability effectively of anybody and everybody to make to publish an expression and have it seen by everybody. I mean, to give you an example, if one of you were to stand up at the back now and start shouting epithets at us, uh, etc., somebody probably nice from the festival would come in and hustle them away. Oh, no, no, I'd encourage them to express their opinions <laughs> and see if there was a brain behind the remark. That's right. When, 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 when Roger's presenting his uh, programme on Radio 4, the thing he likes above all is for people to burst into the studio <laughs> when he's broadcasting. It's, it's encouraged. Would add some life. <laughs> and it would. <laughs> Very unfair. It's a great programme. I mean, <laughs> really. Anyway, I, that's what I think I should leave by saying at the moment. Should we just look at a couple of things that underline this? Let's start by... The suggestion is that certain people need protecting, not us, but there's an argument people need protecting. Supposing that there's a, uh, a disabled person out there, and I call them a spastic. Now, I would have used that term 40 years ago. Now it's offensive if I use the word nigger, which some people said I shouldn't use at all. The assumption is that there are people out there so offended and so vulnerable to offence that they need to be protected. Now, is that the case? And in which case is their need to be protected so great that the rest of us should moderate what we say? Joanna, can you think of cases where simply because of how much a small section of society would be hurt, we should not say something. No, I can't. And and as I, I I'm in, I'm a free speech absolutist. I mean, I'll be absolutely clear about this. I I, I am a free speech absolutist. But I think w the point you're making. Um, really illustrates for me one of the, the reasons why I am a free speech absolutist because I think it, you actually bring prejudice back in through the back door when you start uh, defining limits to free speech so you start saying some groups of people are more sensitive are less easy to cope with debate um, are are, are, are just more vulnerable than others. So we start so making So that means that those people who are going to be genuinely hurt, you say to them, it's too bad, it's in the greater good. I think the corollary of no, this... No, are you saying that, that they just have to put up with it for the greater good? Well, no, I'm not, actually, because I think if I heard anybody using the words that you, you used, um, I would argue back against them. I would say, no, can you not use these words? Can yeah, you not say Yeah, they're probably going to pay this? no attention. And the, question, but the implicit question here is, should we be taking action to stop the expression, either of those views of that language, because there may be people who would be hurt? And you're saying... I think you must be saying there may be people who would be hurt, but there's a larger issue. I am saying that, but I'm not saying, I am saying yes, there's a larger issue. You're absolutely right. I'm saying people might be hurt, but there's a larger issue and the larger issue is free speech. But I'm also not saying um, that 
everybody in the world has to turn into this kind of really tough individual and just take it all on the chin and we should all go around throwing the most uh, offensive insults at the most vulnerable people in society and just expect them to kind of lap it up in the name of free speech. I'm saying society is a collective and as a collective if we see people saying things we disagree with uh, we can argue back against them. We can say I disagree with what you've said. We can stick up for other people and I think that's solid Solidarity, where we act collectively to defend and to stick up for people is really important and actually well, just hate speech question? legislation takes away our ability to act in solidarity with others. Well I'll come to legislation later but David can I uh, is it can we make a distinction between ideas and facts can we say and I ask you as a Jew this question Holocaust denial versus if you like criticism uh, of Jews more generally or Israel is there a way you could disagree where you say society has an obligation to say these facts exist opinions about the causes are fine but the facts can't be denied I'm thinking back to a situation where for example I understand some Japanese schools history books don't refer to Manchuria and what the Japanese did in Manchuria so you don't know the appalling things that happened and elsewhere so is can you make that distinction well that is, it's an interesting that you should put that example at the end because that's quite a good example for more debates talks and interviews subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV